Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 26, Text 3, Translation and Commentary by His Divine Grace, Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is the Supreme Soul, and He has no beginning. He is transcendental to the material modes of nature and beyond the existence of this material world. He is perceivable everywhere because he is self-effulgent and by his self-effulgent luster the entire creation is maintained. Purport The Supreme Personality of Godhead is described as being without beginning. He is Purusha, the Supreme Spirit. Purusha means person. When we think of our person, when we think of a person in our present experience, that person has a beginning. This means that he has taken birth and that, that there is a history from the beginning of his life. But the Lord is particularly mentioned here as anadi, beginningless. If we examine all persons, we will find that everyone has a beginning. But when we approach a person who, who has no beginning, he is the Supreme Person. That is the definition given in the Brahma Sanghita. Ishvarah Paramaha Krishna. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is Krishna, the Supreme Controller. He is without beginning and he is the beginning of everyone. This definition is found in all Vedic literatures. The Lord is described as the soul or spirit. What is the definition of spirit? Spirit is perceivable everywhere. Brahman means great. His greatness is perceived everywhere. And what is that greatness? Consciousness. We have personal experience of consciousness for it is spread all over the body. In every hair follicle of our body, we can feel consciousness. This is individual consciousness. Similarly, there is superconsciousness. The example can be given of a small light and the sunlight. The sunlight is perceived everywhere, even within the room or in the sky. But the small light is experienced within a specific limit. Similarly, our consciousness is perceived within the limit of our particular body, but the superconsciousness or the existence of God is perceived everywhere. He is present everywhere by His energy. It is stated in the Vishnu Purana that whatever we find anywhere and everywhere is the distribution of the energy of the Supreme Lord. In Bhagavad Gita also it is confirmed that the Lord is all-pervading and exists everywhere by his two kinds of energy, one spiritual and the other material. Both the spiritual and material energies are spread everywhere, and that is the proof of the existence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The existence of consciousness everywhere is not temporary. It is without beginning, and because it is without beginning, it is also without end. The theory that consciousness develops at a certain stage of material combination is not accepted herein. For the consciousness which exists everywhere is said to be without beginning. The materialistic or atheistic theory stating that there is no soul, that there is no God, and that consciousness is the result of a combination of matter is not acceptable. Matter is not beginningless, it has a beginning. As this material body has a beginning, the universal body does also. And as our material body has begun on the basis of our soul, the entire gigantic universal body has begun on the basis of the Supreme Soul. The Vedanta Sutra says, Janmadhyasya, this entire material exhibition, its creation, its growth, its maintenance and its dissolution is an emanation from the Supreme Person. In Bhagavad Gita also the Lord says, I am the beginning, the source of birth of everything. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is described here. He is not a temporary person, nor does he have a beginning. He is without a cause, and he is the cause of all causes. Paraha means transcendental, beyond the creative energy. 
The Lord is the creator of the creative energy. We can see that there is a creative energy in the material world, but He is not under this energy. He is Prakriti Paraha, beyond this energy. He is not subjected to the threefold miseries created by the material energy because He is beyond it. The modes of material nature do not touch Him. It is explained here, Swayang Jyotihi. He is light Himself. We have experienced in the material we have experience in the material world of one light being a reflection of another, just as moonlight is a reflection of the sunlight. Sunlight is also the ref the reflection of the Brahma Jyoti. Similarly, Brahma Jyoti, the spiritual effulgence, is a reflection of the body of the Supreme Lord. This is confirmed in the Brahma Sanghita, Yasya Prabha Prabhavataha. The Brahma Jyoti or Brahman effulgence is due to his bodily luster. Therefore it is said here, Swayang Jyoti, he, he himself is light. His light is distributed in different ways as the Brahma Jyoti, as sunlight and as moonlight. Bhagavad Gita confirms that in the spiritual world there is no need of sunlight, moonlight or electricity. The Upanishads also confirm this. Because the bodily luster of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is sufficient to illuminate the spiritual world, there is no need of sunlight, moonlight or any other light or electricity. This self-illumination also contradicts the theory that the spirit soul or the spiritual consciousness develops at a certain point in material combination. The term Swayang Jyotihi indicates that there is no tinge of anything material or, or any material reaction. It is confirmed here that the concept of the Lord's all-pervasiveness is due to His illumination everywhere. We have experienced that the sun is situated in one place, but the sunlight is diffused all around for millions and millions of miles. That is our practical experience. Similarly, although the Supreme Light is situated in His personal abode, Vaikuntha or Vrindavan, his light is diffused not only in the spiritual world but beyond that. In the material world also that light is reflected by the sun globe and the sunlight is reflected by the moon globe. Thus, although he is situated in his own abode, his light is distributed all over the spiritual and material worlds. The Brahma Sanghita confirms this. Goloka eva nivasatya kela atmabhutaha. He is living in Golok, but still he is present all over the creation. He is the super soul of everything, the supreme personality of Godhead, and he has innumerable transcendental qualities. It is also concluded that although he is undoubtedly a person, he is not a purusha of this material world. Mayavadi philosophers cannot understand this. Sorry, Mayavadi philosophers cannot understand that beyond that beyond this material world there can be a person. Therefore, they are impersonalists. But it is explained very nicely here that the personality of Godhead is beyond material existence. Om Jnana Tibirandhasya Jnanam Jana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guravena Maha Vandeham Shri Guroshi Padakamalam Shri Guru Navaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Titanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shiva Shakan Vitam Scha Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Prabhupada has given one of his longer purports to this verse, which helps us in understanding the position of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in relationship to this material world. We are in material consciousness. And therefore, it is difficult for us to understand the Personality of Godhead, who is Ishwarang Prakriti Param. He is the supreme controller beyond 
the material energy, the same is stated here, nirguna, prakriti, paraha. And even many people who they can conceive that there is a supreme person or entity, supreme power beyond this material existence. They cannot understand how he is the supreme person. And therefore they conclude that just like here it's mentioned nirguna. They conclude that because the Supreme Lord cannot be affected or the Supreme Absolute Truth cannot be affected by the material qualities. Therefore he is nirguna, has no qualities at all. But nirguna must be understood to mean that he is not affected by the material qualities. Otherwise, they come up with philosophical impossibilities. But this, the general conception of God is, is as a philosophical impossibility. The, the nirvisheshvadis, which we generally call mayavadis, they accept that there is reality. There is dravya, there is substance. But they say it is nirguna. Reality has no qualities. And therefore everything here is not reality. Because it is perceived as having qualities. And the Buddhists, they have an even more strange theory that there is no dravya, there is no substance whatsoever. Nothing exists. But there is guna. You want me to explain that? Well, I can't. You better ask a Buddhist. <laughs> it's pretty difficult to understand. Nothing has qualities. You're looking confused. Well, I'm also confused. I remember many years ago, some, I this, I this, the first section of Chaitanya Charitamrita that Prabhupada published was chapter 7 of Adi Lila. Lord Chaitanya in Five Features, which has some description of the Mayavadi philosophy in the purports and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's rebuttal of that. So I was going through that when I was newly in the movement and I was, I was asking a senior devotee, you know, what's this all about? I can't follow it. I can't understand it. And he said that, well, a devotee said to Prabhupada, the Prabhupada, I can't understand this Mayavadi philosophy. Prabhupada said, that's good. If you, <laughs> if you can understand it, you'll be in trouble. It doesn't make any sense. But it seems to make sense. I mean, they have the Mayavadis, beginning with the Mayavadi Acharya, Shankara Acharya, has made a huge body of literature, so much philosophy, to describe how everything is an illusion. So they've made a lot, so much description. And the Buddhists also, they have so much philosophy in Buddhism to describe how everything is nothing. And they'll fight amongst themselves, the Buddhists, that nothing is like this. No, it's like that. It's all nothing, but it's nothing like... It's this kind of nothing, and not that kind of nothing. So if we engage in... Actually, where's the philosophical discussion? Who is there to discuss all these things nowadays? But if we take away all the fancy terms they use and all the complex philosophical discussions, we'll find that actually what the Mayavadis are saying is all nonsense. And some of our Vaishnava Acharyas, they did that, Vadi Raja in particular, he reduced all the Mayavadi arguments to their bare essentials 
and showed that they are ridiculous. And Prabhupada and all the Vaishnava Acharyas since that time have been using these arguments. Just like to say that, well, if you say that the Jiva is this, the absolute truth, then how come he's in Maya? Then, then Maya is greater than the absolute truth. Then. Or if everything is one, then how, how is there Maya? Or if you say that the Jiva by knowledge becomes liberated, and then all the G, all they're all one, so all should become liberated all at once. Prabhupada, he used to use words like nonsense, which is actually they don't deserve so much discussion. So you can just take it all and throw it in the trash bin. You ever do that? You go in people's houses and you see books by all these different swamis and. And they're very respectful and you say, You'd like me to do something to bless your family? Yes, Swamiji. You want whatever it is you want to object. No, no. And then you take all their Mayavadi books and say, I'd like to take these books with me. And then you burn them or best thing is to burn them and cook some chapatis on top. <laughs> that way they can the Mayavadis can do some savor. Because you have to offer the chapati to Krishna. People, uh, they are attracted. That Lord Krishna states in Bhagavad Gita, they are attracted to demoniac and atheistic views. Moghasha mogha karmano mogha jnana vicheta saha rakshasim asarim chaiva prakritim mohining shitaha They are attracted, persons who are attracted to demoniac and atheistic views, they like it. They like to hear that we are all God. They don't stop to think that well, if I'm God, why do I have to go out and work and to earn money and come home and then uh, my wife is complaining, you're not bringing enough money and it's all my lila. <laughs> they think like that. One of the most prominent Mayavadis of the modern age was the he was the first president of so-called so independent India. And he wrote his commentary on Bhagavad Gita. He was, he was famous as a... He wasn't a politician so much. He was well known as a philosopher. Just like the present president of India, he wasn't known as a public figure or a politician. He was known as a scientist and a philosopher of sorts. So Dr. Radha Krishnan was... Oops, I said his name. Anyway, he was known as a philosopher. So he gave all these, uh, he wrote not only his commentary on Bhagavad Gita, but so many different books of philosophy. He wrote a history of Indian, big volumes, and, and all in Mayavad. It means his idea is everything is all one. Prabhupada very strongly criticized his philosophical lucubrations. So here, their philosophy is that, well, we're here in Maya, but it's just, actually we're all Bhagavan and it's all our Leela. But he ended his life living like a vegetable, means he, he just, he became senile and lost consciousness of what's going on and Prabhupada went to visit him when Prabhupada visited Madras in the early 1970s. But he couldn't say anything. His consciousness had merged into the divine or not non-divine stupidity. He'd, he'd lost, he was a very intelligent person, but he'd lost his intelligence and he, he couldn't recognize anyone. He'd become mentally decrepit. So this was the result of his claiming to be God, he was getting preparation for entering the species, the vegetable species of life. He was a philosopher, no doubt, but with the demoniac propensity. So the Bhagavatam here, Bhagavatam means it's the 
commentary of the Vedanta Sutra, which clearly, actually Vedanta Sutra is clear, but because our consciousness is unclear, if we read the Shastra, we don't find Krishna. Krishna is everywhere. But we don't see Krishna because our consciousness is not clear. Here in this verse, it's stated that the Supreme Lord can be perceived everywhere. We say, why don't we see him? Because we are blind. Otherwise, we should be able to see Krishna everywhere. Krishna, in this verse, Prabhupada, this Swayam Jyoti, he is self-effulgent, so whatever light we see, Prabhasmi, Shashi, Surya, Yaho, the light and the, of the sun and the moon, that is Krishna. We should be able to see Krishna everywhere and at all times. But we don't see Krishna because our consciousness is not clear. Otherwise, everything in, in, in everything, we should be able to recognize Krishna's presence. Nowadays, people are very educated, but their education covers their seeing Krishna. Otherwise, a simple-minded simple person, who people think is unintelligent, they can very easily understand. You explain that everything is the manifestation of God's energy. They can accept. But when you become educated, they explain differently that this energy is coming from that and the interaction of atoms and waves and molecules and, and they think there's no need to see God. So, the so-called less intelligent person who's more intelligent, then by seeing material nature he sees Krishna everywhere. And when you become so-called educated, then seeing material nature, you, you presume that there is no God anywhere. So this is the result of modern education, or atheistic education. Their great, by their great intelligence, they increase their foolishness. They start off with the premise that asatyam apratishtam te jagadahur anishwaram there's no God in control. They, they start, this is their premise. That there's no God in control. There's no basis of the universe. It just exists. And they think this is scientific because science means that we accept which we can perceive, which we can prove. And we can't, we didn't find God in our test tube yet. There's no, there's no evidence of any God. It's such fools. It's so stupid. And they give each other PhDs and Nobel Prizes. It's one donkey decorating another donkey, that's all. It's so foolish that we cannot see God, therefore he does. There's no scientific proof of it. You damn fooled idiots. Of course you can't see him because he's not perceivable by the, any material means. If he was perceivable by material means, then he wouldn't be God, you fools. He said, well, we couldn't see him. Uh, of course you can't see him. <laughs> you never will see him in your test tube or in your, your, your thinking and working out mathematically, trying to work out what's the origin of the creation. You'll never find him. It's not possible. If you could find God by such a way, then he wouldn't be God because by definition he is Ishvaram Prakrite Param. If he's subject to your test tubes and your Bunsen burners, then how is he God? But because they have the demoniac way of thinking that every, everything I should understand, everything I should be able to understand. Otherwise, we can't accept it. But what is our insignificance? This we should first try to understand. Before you study physics, we don't say stop. You would study, but first before studying physics, biology, chemistry, engineering, all these things. First of all, study who are we, how insignificant we are. They should understand, astrophysicists, at least they should understand, how tiny our position is in the universe, as Prabhupada points out here. The light of the sun 
reaches us from millions of, you see that there you see this light of the sun shining on the floor that comes from millions of miles away we should consider how insignificant we are but we're thinking oh I'm so important and I have declared that there is no God so there's no God that's the proof I said so foolish so this scientific knowledge, so-called scientific knowledge, is very prominent in the world today. I was saying Bhagavatam is commentary on Vedanta Sutra. So we may not recognize it, but the statements in here and in the purport the Prabhupada has given they're actually following on from the thesis of Vedanta Sutra because Vedanta Sutra is Vyasadeva's establishing Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu the actual subject matter of the Vedas in opposition to the various materialistic philosophers who have misinterpreted the Vedas so there are, different, there are different philosophers. There are persons who say that material nature is eternal. There's no beginning and there's no end. And there are those who say that uh, the whole material creation is just going on by the interaction of Purusha and Prakriti. And even though there is Ishvara, he is not Ishvara Prakriti Param. Ishvara is just some function. There are those who say that, that, that there is Ishvara, but Ishvara is also subject to Maya, Mayavadis. That ultimately everything is without any qualities. There's only one Ekam Brahma Dvitiya Nasti. There's only one supreme absolute truth and there's nothing else in existence there's a Vedic statement but they, they misinterpret it ekam brahma dvitiya nasti means that there is only one supreme lord and no other but they take it to mean that there's only brahma and there's nothing else nothing else exists but there, there's four words right there ekam brahma dvitiya na asti five words so there's five words, but there's only one supreme and nothing else. Anyway, the philosophy stinks. So there were so, so many different philosophies. In the modern age, there is maybe more than at any other time in recent history, means in Kali Yuga. They don't know history before. They, before that they say they were dinosaurs. But more than at any time there is a approaching a philosophical homogeneity or oneness means practically, practically no one's interested in any philosophy anyway. But the, the prominent world view is that every, the, the scientific outlook, everything has come into being by chance. First of all, the universe came into being by chance. And then life came into being by chance. And then human beings came into being by chance. They give the example we say, well, how can it come to be by chance? It is a, it's, it's so complex. And they say, well, it's, it's possible if there's enough chances, anything can happen. They give the example that if you leave a bunch of, bunch of monkeys in a room with a bunch of typewriters, you know what typewriters are? Before there were computers, there were typewriters. And of course the typewriter should be set up with paper inside them and the typewriter should have ink. But by chance, if there's a bunch of typewriters in a room 
and he gets invaded by a bunch of monkeys and they jump around long enough then in course of time they will type out all the works of Shakespeare without any spelling mistakes. <laughs> this is the example given. This is science. Stop laughing. Well, if that's true, then there should also be a universe which is presided over by a giant green gorilla who every three seconds an egg comes out of his ear and out of each egg comes a dinosaur who stands on his head. Right? If, any, if anything's possible by chance, then that should also be possible by chance. You can think of any nonsense thing, it should be possible by, by chance. If, if by the monkeys jumping over the typewriters, this universe is coming to be, then there should be another universe which is presided over by a big green gorilla who out of his ear every three seconds comes an egg, out of which comes a dinosaur that stands on its head, for instance. And any other damn stupid thing you can think of. If, if anything's possible by chance, then everything should be existing by chance. So we're not very impressed with this scientific example. We're impressed with Vyasadeva's delineating the absolute truth. And we're impressed with Prabhupada presenting that. This morning I was listening to Prabhupada his so many times is saying how we should show how these scientists, they're just bluffing and cheating. So I was thinking this life comes from life, this book is so wonderful. How Prabhupada in very clear language, very clearly, he points out all the fallacies of the so-called scientific hypothesis. Actually at the present time is, is, it's a major cultural issue in the Western world, especially in America, how semi-theistic or to be more straightforward, Christian Scientists, there are scientists who profess to be Christians, who they're, they're putting forward that we should not teach, or if we're going to teach evolutionary theory in the schools, we should also teach what they call intelligent design theory, at least as a theory. They say that... Uh, Evolutionary theory has never been proved. And these are scientists who are saying this, that the creation is, or the, or the very term, the creation, or the material cosmos is so complex that it suggests that it, it couldn't come into being by chance, that, that there should be an intelligent designer. So it's a big issue in America that it's, it's come to the courts, different state supreme courts and should it be allowed to be taught or not and that the scientific establishment is very much against the no we should only teach evolutionary theory but more and more scientists are saying that well evolutionary theory it doesn't it it doesn't hold there are so many faults in it and intelligent design is also a very at least as a theory, it, it holds at least as much weight as evolutionary theory. So it's a big struggle is going on. We can see, actually, this is coming up. So many things are coming up in the world because of the distribution of Prabhupada's books. So it, it's quite likely that within the next generation or so, that intelligent design will be more and more accepted. In other words, 
getting back to what they used to say that God created the universe in simple language. So it's likely that, that that's going to come in as a prominent scientific theory accepted by orthodox scientists. It won't happen very quickly, most likely, because scientific theories, they die with each gen... When a sci what happens in science is when one orthodox theory is shown to be wrong, even though it's shown scientifically to be wrong, it goes on being taught until that generation of scientists who are brought up with it until they've died out because they can't adjust to it they're not scientific enough so they go they stick to it and then the next generation comes up and then they teach the next wrong theory and then someone else comes along and scientifically proves that's wrong and brings in another theory. and this is called progress of science so maybe within a generation this intelligent design theory will become very strong then we should bring in Bhaktivedanta science because if they're going to accept God then they're still left with the reasons that people stop believing in God is that the Western worldview or the Western ideas of God, I mean, they don't have any real theology. They don't, you say God and that's all. Love God. Who is he? Don't know. Where does he live? Don't know. What's his name? Don't, they don't know. There's nothing there. And it's, they're so lacking in theology, they have to make up so many things. That, well, if you believe in Jesus, you go to heaven, and if not, the all merciful God who loves you so much, sends you to hell to burn there forever. So then you say, well, what happens to babies who are... You have to be baptized. And what happens to babies? They die before they get baptized. So they made up a place called limbo, where you're stuck. It's, you're not in heaven and you're not in hell. It's like, it's like uh, Trishanku. You're kind of hanging in between or something. I mean, it's it, theologically, it's philosophically, it's really empty. I mean, I, under, I was brought up in Christianity. By the, by the age of 12, I realized that is a, a, no intelligent person can accept it. It's just... As soon as you start asking any questions, they say, don't ask questions. Just believe what's in the Bible, that's all. Now, why should you believe it? And even in Genesis itself, it says there are different. There, there are such contradictory statements that even even the Catholic Church has come up with statements now that you shouldn't believe everything in the Bible. So they also say that the Catholic Church has come out very strongly against this intelligent design theory. They're promoting. They're they're supporting evolution. The Catholic Church has got the idea that, well, God, he just, he just throws out the garbage one day and then it all has, a, it all has a big bang and then by chance it evolves evolutionary. Then God comes back and looks at it and says, hmm, okay. And then he jumps down in, into the world and gets killed on the cross and then, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if they thought about it too much. They don't seem to have very good theology but the catholic church they're against intelligent design theory and the protestants are for it and it's a big confusion so the thing is that if people are going to believe in god they're going to want to know more about him is a theologically christianity is empty so Vedanta gives knowledge. What is the nature of God? Who is He? What does He do? How does He interact with this material world? It's all described here. So, devotees are meant to be theologians, to understand the science of God, Bhagavat Tattva Vigyanam, to know this, to present this, to give 
factual knowledge of the personality of Godhead. Not just that you believe, but that Supreme Person has given us intelligence by which we can understand Him to some extent. So to just believe, that is unscientific. But Krishna doesn't teach anything unscientific. Jnanam teham savigyanam idam vakshyami asheshataha yajgyatva neha bhuyo nyaj gyatavyam avashishyate Lord Krishna states in Bhagavad Gita that now I'm going to teach you that scientific knowledge by knowing which nothing else shall remain to be known. So Krishna explains, he doesn't just say, well, I'm God and you just believe me or I'll throw you into hell forever. But he explains that this, this is my nature. How is he to be understood? How are we covered by illusion? What, who is the supreme absolute person? What is our relationship with him? Why we don't perceive him now? Being covered. Shribhya gunamaya bhavaya. We are covered by the three modes of material nature. How we can become free from that influence. Everything is explained scientifically. Science is not something invented by the all these Copernicus, Galileo and Newton and all these people. Science that's there in Shastra, actual science. Bhaktivedanta. So devotees should understand this and distribute these books. People are in such illusion of what is their purpose of life. But by distributing these books, the effect will be there. Many times devotees ask, oh, well, what's the use? Do we distribute these books? People don't read. But they do read. I, I, definitely they do. I was just in Vishakapatnam and Vizianagaram. And I found so many people, they have Prabhupada's books and they're reading them. In Vizianagaram area I found that so many people, just, just go in some village and ask the people who have got Prabhupada's books, everyone. Sometimes Padiyatra comes, everyone buys the book. And our Sankitan buses go there, everyone's got it. They've all got It's having its effect. No doubt. So, so many people, it's in some places it's difficult to sell Bhagavad Gita Yatha Tatam because they, they have. So you can push this Krishna book also. It's very important Krishna book. Prabhupada states, anyone who reads this book, just by reading this book, one can become completely perfect and go back to God. One can develop pure love of Krishna just by reading this book. People can understand who is the personality of Godhead just by reading this book. So you should put all these books, Life Comes From Life, very important book, revolutionary book, all of Prabhupada's books. This Bhagavatam, first canto. So many people are surprised to read how Prabhupada has analyzed all the faults of human society. What are the solutions? All subject matters are covered in Prabhupada's books. They give solutions to all the problems, at least in seed form. And then that's for Prabhupada's disciples to develop these themes, just like Prabhupada wanted Bhaktivedanta Institute to develop the, the ideas which Prabhupada was giving. So, all these different things, economics, science, sociology, Philosophy, of course, all economics, all subject matters are there in Prabhupada's books. And those who, those who are more intelligent, they will understand this. More intelligent doesn't necessarily mean MSc, PhD, but those whose spiritual intelligence is beginning to be awakened. So this month in particular, we... we Stress the distribution of Prabhupada's books, but actually it's always distribute and read also. Read the books.
How will we get inspiration to distribute the books? Read the books. If we're reading, then we must become inspired to distribute them. If we're not reading Prabhupada's books, then it's it's how can we actually understand what is Krishna consciousness? Then we'll we'll just have our own misconceptions in the name of Krishna consciousness. So please read these books and distribute these books. Gradually it's having its effect. You might not see, but I'm seeing, Ananda Mai Prabhu is seeing. We're seeing the difference between 30 years ago and now, the effect of this book distribution. What do you say, Ananda Mai Prabhu? Difference in consciousness, isn't there? The whole way people perceive our movement and the, the whole religious atmosphere, it's different to what it used to be. Previously, in India, as soon as you open your mouth and start to preach, you say, no, 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 everything's all one, Advaita Vaya, it's just, every, it's just like banging your head against a brick wall, wasn't it? It was so tough, it was so, so full of Advaita Vaya. But now people are coming and immediately they're ready to, they're, they're, they're actually looking for devotees to come and guide them in this. In that area, I'm saying also, so many people are reading that uh, beginner's guide and taking it up. So definitely the books are having their effect. We can see, in one generation we've seen. We'll see more. Anything else you'd like to say about that, Ananda Mai Prabhu? He's sitting there, quietly working away, getting the books <laughs> produced. He understood. <laughs> what Prabhupada wants. Another thing I'm thinking is that often in the present days we're very concerned about you know, in ISKCON, you may not see so much here, but there are so many different ideas and reinterpretations and we're wondering, you know, so, so many different ideas and redefining ISKCON in different ways, but as long as the books are there and how people, they can redefine this way, that way, and the other way. But people, when they read the books, they'll know. If people are actually reading the books, Prabhupada's books, then they'll know what is Krishna consciousness and what isn't. Even they may introduce so many strange things into our society, but those who want the real thing, they can always know what it is from reading Prabhupada's books. Of course, there are also, there are also moves to edit Prabhupada's books and change them, but even if they do, there'll be those who won't accept that. They'll want to read Prabhupada's books as they are. So, sometimes we might feel discouraged by some of the trends in our society, but that's inevitable that, that people will want to, whenever there's any religious movement, people, some people will come and want to redefine it in their own way or take advantage of it for their own material sense gratification. But those who are essence seekers, they will always find out where is the essence. They're definitely in any religious society, even that which is based on the highest truth, there will be people who will take advantage. There's money, there's buildings. So people will come and want to use for their own sense gratification. But those who are sincere, they'll find out those who are dedicated to the principle and not to the plaster, not to the paisa, those who are dedicated to the principle. So there's great hope. As long as the books are there, go on distributing the books, read the books, live by the books, seek the association of those who live by the books, and then we'll be all right. Jai, Hare Krishna. Any question? about all this. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, uh, this is with regard to the Ramayana which you have compiled. Hare Krishna. Mm, okay, Maharaj, this is with regard to the Ramayana which you have compiled. Uh, last time uh, I had asked you a similar question around an year ago and uh, you told me that uh, in Valmiki's Ramayana mm. there was no mention of uh, Lakshman Rekha but in Skanda Purana we find an uh, uh, a particular point which says that because of this Lakshman Rekha, the Sita that was captured by Ravana 
but not actually the Sita Maya Dharma. Ravana, the yeah. Maya Sita. Yeah, maybe. But I'm just saying it's not in. So it's how, not given in uh, Valmiki Ramayana. So how do we understand both of these things? They seem to be contradictory. No, well, it it may be. I mean, there's nothing philosophically wrong with this story of Lakshman Rekha, but Valmiki, he didn't include it. So what's the question? There's no if it's there in Skanda Purana, there's no contradiction. It's just there are some there are there are I, there are three well-known incidents which are widely broadcast, which about Ram Lila, which are not in um, Valmiki Raman. One is the Lakshman Rekha, the other is Shabari, and the fruit, and there's one other which Rameshwaram hmm? Temple. That Lord Rama worshiping Oh yeah, of Shiva. course. Yeah, Lord Ram worshiping Lord Shiva. There's nothing wrong with any of these stories, but Valmiki, at least the extended editions of Ramayana, we don't have them in the those stories in the. You look like you want to go and chastise Valmiki. <laughs> You have some confusion? Maharaj, because if we, we do not take this point into consideration, then I get a doubt that uh, when uh, Lord Rama was performing his... The thing is, you see, people pull a scroll cord out of Skanda Purana, this Purana, this, that. We have to understand that the Puranas are also meant for different classes of people. Not everything is meant for everyone. Or even what's in Shastra, our Vaishnava Acharyas, they're also called Skanda Purana or Shiva Purana, they may quote also. But everything has to be understood from the perspective of Krishna. What is the purpose of Shastra? So in Shastra, there are also some things which are not Siddhanta. They may be against Siddhanta. Just like the, or, or they have to be understood very carefully. Just like this, this, this uh, they're there. Our acharyas have said that they are, they are for the purpose of asura vimohanam, for bewildering the demons. So the stories of the queens being kidnapped, the white hair and the black hair of Mahavishnu becoming Balaram and Krishna. So these are there, Krishna dying, being killed. So these are there. One purpose is to bewilder the demons. Although if understood through the Acharyas, they can be properly understood. There's no problem, just like Lord, Sh Lord Rama is worshipping Lord Shiva, there's no problem. Philosophically, there's no problem in that. If it's understood from the point of view of Leela, Lord Krishna used to worship Lord Shiva also. But that doesn't change the absolute fact that Lord Shiva is a devotee of Lord Krishna. That Lord Krishna's position is always superior to that of Lord Shiva. That doesn't change. Lord Krishna, he, he washed the feet of Sudama. But that doesn't mean that Sudama is... Krishna may consider him superior, but Sudama is not the substantive principle of reality. Krishna is. So everything has to be understood very carefully. We should understand carefully. Siddhanta baliya chitte na karaha alash eha hoite krishne lage sudhiramanash we should not be lazy in understanding Siddhanta. By understanding Siddhanta, our mind becomes very strongly attached to Krishna. And on the other hand, Siddhanta alashjun anartha tocharena. If we are lazy in the matter of understanding Siddhanta, then we cannot give up anarthas. We cannot throw them off. All these anarthas, calm, crowd, lobe, moha, material attachment, they all spring 
from the misconception of considering myself an, an enjoyer separate from Krishna. And all the all the different kinds of opposites, they all spring from this. So we should understand carefully. Anvayad Vyatireka Bhyam in all in detail, directly, indirectly, we should understand all these points. Yeah, then anything else? Now you should read Prabhupada's books more carefully. See what Prabhupada is saying. Because we'll find there's there are many people who are speaking from Prabhupada's books, but you may not even recognize. They mix it up with a little 10%, 20% of some other ideas. They may not even be aware they're doing it. Mixed up with the Western humanistic worldview, that's coming in very prominent. So, we should un understand Prabhupada as he is, or as he presents Krishna. We should understand Krishna as Prabhupada presents. If we mix it up with atheistic, humanistic, psychological ideas, then we'll end up in a mother's womb. We might become a great philosopher in our next life. What's the use? Philosophy means to understand we're servants of Krishna. That's philosophy. Anything else is not philosophy. Hare Krishna. We'll finish there.